Uh, there's some more for you. Thank you, Livia, and thank you, Florine, and uh, thank you, Delia, for having me. And also thanks to uh, Radu for the residency in uh, the framework of which uh, I came to Yash also. Um, so the, I prepared a talk which um, is not a kind of a typical curatorial talk that would speak about the, all the different projects that I have been uh, busy with lately, but instead I decided to focus on one project which is more uh, research-based and uh, which is also part of a bigger collective project. So um, um, I will speak about the, a project that I did uh, within the framework of a research course called uh, Decolonizing uh, Architecture at the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm, uh, led by Alessandro Petti, who is an uh, Italian architect, the new professor of, archi of architecture at the Royal Institute of Art. And uh, the course was invited to participate in the framework of uh, 5 by 5 by 5 of the Manifesto oh. 12 in Palermo, which is a kind of new platform that invites uh, five artists, five galleries, and five educational institutions. So, um, so there's the kind of framework for, um, for my research that I'll present to you um, today. And so the manifesto opened in the beginning of the second week of uh, June. So uh, during the time the course organized the conference and uh, also we presented our research in form of uh, uh, similar brochures uh, that I'll explain about a little bit more. Um, and uh, this, is the, this is one picture of a building where we're working. It's called the uh, Casa del Mutilato, which is the uh, house of the, of the mutili. Um, so it's, uh, it's a building that was built in uh, Palermo by architect uh, Giuseppe Spatrisano. It was planned in 1935 and uh, finished in 1939. And it's a building for the soldiers that were mutilated um, and lost arms or legs or other parts of their bodies in the World War I and in the Spanish Civil War and in the colonial wars in East Africa. And, uh, Around the country, around Italy, there were uh, almost 80 similar buildings that were built during the fascist periods uh, to take care of the soldiers uh, that were mutilated in the previous wars. Um, so we kind of started from, the, from this building as a possible site of heritage. Um, we're trying to look into, um, you can maybe see in the, in the middle of the oculus of the building that it's a little bit crumbling. So uh, the question was also like, uh, what kind of heritage is the fascist heritage? And if this heritage needs to be taken care of and reconstructed, uh, in what ways it is going to be uh, reconstructed? And also what this architecture can tell us um, today about the history of Italy and also about the, not only about the fascist history, but also about the colonial history of Italy that is concurrent with the fascist history. And uh, to speak about this, I wanted to show a few slides of uh, what could be seen as uh, fascist architecture in Romania to kind of a little bit try to relate to, uh, to the Romanian context. So uh, I was quite lucky that I met in, uh, in Bucharest, uh, Dana Andrei and uh, Zorin Popescu, who um, kind of directed my attention a little bit to, uh, to fascist architecture in Romania because it's kind of difficult to uh, find things in English. 
uh, but this is a train station in uh, Bucharest, built in 1935. Um, it's, uh, it was built actually for the, um, uh, for the royal court, so on the, on the track between here and the castle in Palesh, I think. And um, so the, it seems that the fascist architecture in, uh, well, what could be called the fascist architecture in uh, Romania was very much connected to the monarchy and to this building of this new image of this grandiose uh, Romania uh, and modernization. So this is the um, train station, sorry for my pronunciation, but this is the uh, Benesa train station? Benesa. Um, this is two different buildings. Uh, it's the Ministry of National Propaganda on the, on the left side, built in 1938. And on the right side, there's uh, this kind of uh, relief on the pavilion of uh, Transdinistria, which was built in 1941-1942. Uh, and I chose this image with the relief with, the, with Saint George de defeating the dragon, uh, which is in um, in relation to the siege of Odessa in 1941, uh, because my talk we also talk a lot about uh, religious symbolism, so I also chose this uh, this picture that has this. Uh, of course, it's kind of defeating also the, the, this religious country is also defeating the uh, this kind of Soviet Union that didn't have that was uh, not in favor of church. And the last example, or second last example, is the tower of the so-called disobedience of Bessarabia, which was built uh, near Chisinau in, in 1942. And uh, I also chose this example because um, I'm also going to speak about the Crusade, and uh, you can also see how a certain kind of visual language um, is also being reused by the fascists in relation to the Crusader castles and, uh, uh, and similar structures. And uh, the last building which I have chosen because it's most similar to the building in Palermo is the, the general union of the Romanian industries in, uh, in Bucharest, um, built in 1938. So uh, this is just to like relate a little bit of uh, what the potential size of uh, fascist architecture could be in uh, in Romania. And uh, so this is the building in Palermo that we worked with. It's uh, still run by this association of the war mutinies, uh, but because it's 2018, so it's uh, 100 years since the end of the World War One. So very few of these people, or almost none of them, are alive anymore. And uh, but the building is still run by this association and it rents out uh, different facilities to, um, uh, to, the peace of, to the justice of peace and to a law company and uh, to a school. But the, the, the idea was, uh, the idea maybe more of uh, my professor than the idea of my talk, was to look into how this uh, fascist architecture could be kind of redistributed to the communities that have been uh, historically and today affected by fascism. So how maybe uh, communities, uh, migrant communities, but also other uh, minoritized communities could actually get hold of uh, this material infrastructure of, uh, of fascism and maybe use it as, uh, as their kind of rooms for, um, for meetings and seminars and for whatever they need. Um, so uh, my focus uh, has been, I actually focus on more things, but I'll only present one of them. My focus has been these two frescoes uh, that are in the in the atrium of the of the building, um, which were done in 1940, one year after the building has been completed, uh, by Giuseppe Antonio Santagata, who was an Italian painter who um, uh, who has done a lot of monumental works uh, for many of these Casa de Mutilato around Italy, in Rome, but also in other parts of uh, Italy. So he almost had a kind of uh, monopoly on, uh, on decorating them with his frescoes, but also with mosaics. Um, so um, these frescoes are called, um, the one on your left hand side is called Waiting for the Battle. So you see a soldier looking at the clock. And then the one on the right side is called The Battle, when you can see the, uh, the soldiers kind of jumping out of the trenches and uh, launching an offensive. Um, yeah, this is one of the preparation cartons uh, for another um, fresco by Santa Gata. Um, 
And then there's a picture of me and my classmate kind of introducing uh, the, the group research. I mean, we were over um, 10 people uh, in the course, um, closer to 15. Um, and uh, um, the conference happened at this, uh, you can really see it, but it's a scissor lift that could go up and down as this kind of metaphor of, um, for, the, for the heritage reconstruction um, as this lift that you would need to kind of reconstruct the building, to restore it. Uh, but also the speakers who were giving the talks in the conference, they were also in this position of uh, kind of Mussolini on the, uh, on the balcony of uh, Piazza Venezia giving the talks. So this was actually an idea of my classmate Bert Stoffels, who uh, came with this idea. Uh, for the intervention for the um, for the conf conference, and then each of us has done like separate kind of research. Now I only speak about mine, and um, and I came with the idea of doing uh, something like this, which would be uh, a, like format of a typical tourist brochure. So you can see me on the picture, like holding the brochure, which looks a little bit differently because it has been redesigned. Uh, and actually giving a tour of the building, like in front of the frescoes. And the idea with the brochures has been to, uh, to make this kind of almost conceptual uh, step to make the building public uh, by making it look public. So the same way how you come to the museum or to any kind of like a tourist site and you can have these brochures where you can like read about the history of this building. So uh, each of us in the course, we try to insert our research which quite often has been dealing with these uh, stories that the building can tell you, but it's trying not to tell you. This kind of like um, uh, silence histories. So if each of us tried to make a similar brochure and you could come as a visitor and you could take any of the brochures and you could engage with the building from this kind of uh, other side of the history. That is not the fascist side of the history, but the, the history of those who has been oppressed. And then also for me, like um, I have to say that this uh, research that I'm going to present it's uh, partly speculative because the, everything that I'm going to tell you is true and also uh, the frescoes are true, but uh, I kind of used the opportunity of um, doing this research course within an art school and not within a new university, also for kind of uh, like playing a little bit with uh, speculation and playing with fact and fiction and kind of connecting things that might not necessarily be connected, but still give it the and uh, so I wanted to use also this brochure as something that legitimizes the research that uh, you come there and because it has the format of this research of this tourist brochure so you will take it as the, tr as the truth somehow. Um, so it's also something that you can, uh, you can take with you uh, afterwards. Um, so to tell you a little bit about these frescoes, I mean I said that, uh, they were painted in uh, 1940 which was one year after the building has been um, Inaugurated, and 1940 was also the year when Italy entered uh, the World War II by declaring war on uh, on France and uh, and the UK. Uh, so Italy entered uh, World War II one year later compared to uh, to Germany and um, and other countries in Europe. So this is actually the year when Italy entered the war, and uh, I was trying to look into because we don't know anything. Uh, content related uh, about these frescoes. So I was trying to find out like what kind of battle could these frescoes uh, depict. Um, because on the, on the pillars that are next to the frescoes, there is names of different uh, battles of the World War I. There's Piave, but many others. And on the right side you can see um, Africa O, which stands for Africa Orientale, East Africa, uh, Spania, Sp Spain, the Spanish Civil War. So there's uh, um, these battles and these wars are kind of like named on the pillars. Um, but I, I couldn't know like uh, if this fresco is kind of show like battle in general or whether they are showing a particular battle. Um, so because I studied art history and we had this kind of course in iconography which I didn't uh, really enjoy back then, but this time I thought that I could kind of make a subverted use of it. So I started looking at like different visual clues uh, in the in the frescoes to try to locate the to try to locate the battle, and then uh, you can see on the on the right top corner you can see the hill with the three crosses and this aura. So that's of course the 
the traditional iconographical depiction of uh, Calvary on Golgotha, uh, where Christ, together with two thieves, was, uh, was crucified um, outside of Jerusalem. Um, so through this, but also through the fact that the, the name of the building officially is Casa de Mutilato, but on the, at the entrance, uh, the name that is carved actually in the stone is um, Tempio Munito Fortezza Mystica, which is a kind of uh, temple with the powers or with the quality of, of a mystical fortress. And uh, so I started looking into different uh, uh, relations of, um, um, of fascism and church, uh, particularly. Um, so, um, so I tried to then think about the, if, uh, if what we see in the background, if this is actually um, Golgotha, then could then the landscape that we see, could this be somehow the, the Holy Land? And what the other part of the landscape uh, could mean? So I'll take them um, kind of one by one. There's like kind of just actually two or three. And I want you now to pay attention to the ruin of the White House in the foreground on, uh, on the other fresco. If you can see it, can everyone see it? Um, so I decided to like uh, to look at this uh, ruin um, as the ruin of the second Solomon Temple that has been uh, destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. And um, I also uh, I should also say that actually looking at the soldiers, I mean you can clearly see that they are kind of contemporary, uh, but because the because the frescoes have this uh, monumental timelessness. So for me, it also allowed uh, it also allowed me to to read these frescoes on this like level of three temporalities. On the, the first temporality would be antiquity, the times of the of the Roman Empire, um, which was the time when uh, uh, the so-called Holy Land was uh, one of the provinces of Roman Empire, the Judea. Yeah. Then the the second temporality is the temporality of the Middle Ages and of the Crusades. Uh, when the Christians come to recover the Holy Land um, from the Muslims. And the third temporality is the, is the contemporaneity of that moment, the fascist Italy and its colonial interest in the Middle East. Um, so, um, so kind of like looking back into, uh, into the first uh, temporality, into the antiquity, um, so I'm, I'm trying to say that what we see in the fresco is the Roman soldiers uh, on this punitive expedition um, against the Jewish population um, or against the Jewish insurrections in the year 70 and destroying the second Solomon Temple. So the second Solomon Temple, like this is one of the reconstructions uh, that, uh, that is kind of the most common one. So it's, it's the temple that was destroyed and which is like the, the basis of the uh, of the sorrow of um, of the Jewish community and the Jewish diaspora, so it had actually this you know this very white kind of uh, rectangular basic structure, and uh, if you look at some Romanticist paintings, as this one from the uh, mid 19th century, you have you see these depictions of the Roman soldiers coming and the Jer Jerusalem burning, and you see a white temple in the in the foreground uh, which is being damaged, and I think this Romanticist um, uh, imagery is also something that kind of interests me, like how, how you can kind of see through art history how certain tropes kind of continue um, and their life. So also this uh, war-torn uh, landscape in the background um, is for me very similar to what we see on this picture. Um, the, the spoils of Jerusalem um, um, you can also see them in, in Rome today on the Ark of Titus, so one of the reliefs shows the Roman soldiers um, bring the Torah and the candle holder and all, and all of this. So it's also interesting like how, you know, today in Rome, this is still kind of inscribed in, uh, in marble. Um, and I also included this picture, uh, which is, I actually never remember the name of this man, but I put it down. Um, so um, this is... Um, This is, this is Alec Gerald, who is a man from Norfolk who spent more than 30 years like trying to reconstruct the, uh, the Solomon Temple. 
and uh, this reconstruction is considered like the most accurate and uh, actually why I selected this, uh, this picture, why I included it at the end uh, is because there's a reference to this man in uh, W.G. Zebald's book, uh, Rings of Saturn, which I have been reading at the same time as I have been doing the research. And, um, and I also thought about uh, Zebald as this writer who actually writes about uh, the history of destruction and of the brutality of humanity. So actually the picture that I have selected, um, which is the bombing of Ploist, which I will uh, explain later, is also something that is connected to, uh, to Zebald and to his, um, to his recollections of bombing of Germany. So he's a German writer who moved to the UK in the, in the 60s. Uh, and he writes a lot also about the, the bombings of the World War II, but generally about this kind of um, transience of uh, human existence and of uh, things disappearing, heritage crumbling and so on. Um, and then, of course, in relation to the destruction of the, um, of the Second Solomon Temple, I was also thinking of this like kind of deeply ingrained uh, anti-Semitism and uh, that has been kind of carried through the from the antiquity until the current times. And I selected these two pictures uh, from, uh, from Bucharest, the, the ground and the small Spanish synagogues that have been destroyed in 1941 during the, during the Bucharest program. So it's also kind of a little bit, um, I tried at certain points when it made sense to relate some of the events to the reality of Romania and also trying to see like um, uh, what was going on in Romania at the same time uh, for this talk, I mean, not for the original research. Um, but at the same time, as uh, you saw this uh, white uh, structure, I thought that actually maybe it can be read in, in different ways and it doesn't have to be only a Solomon Temple, only the Solomon Temple, it can also be something different. And um, if you look at this picture, so uh, it's um, this picture is from July 1940, from bombing of Tel Aviv, which is, of course, a city that is known for its uh, uh, modernist architecture of this kind of like uh, Bauhaus of, um, of the Middle East. And again, it's this kind of like white um, uh, rectangular shapes that are also in the, in the White House, in the fresco. And um, so this bombing actually happened the same year as the frescoes were painted. Um, and uh, this is where kind of the story starts being interesting for me. The, the, um, the story of Italian colonialism is always kind of being told in relation to Ethiopia and Eritrea and Libya and to a lesser extent to uh, Albania and to um, parts of Dalmatia and Istria. Um, but actually the Italian colonial ambition uh, during the fascist period has been much larger. And um, what started to be very interesting for me is that the year uh, when the frescoes were painted, it was not only the year when, um, when Italy entered uh, World War II, but uh, shortly after, um, after that happened, uh, roughly one month, there was an agreement between Germany and Italy, between Mussolini and Hitler, and their division of Europe. So basically, if, uh, um, if the Axis uh, would win the World War II, then Italy was promised to have the, the dominance over the med Mediterranean, including the Eastern Mediterranean and the lands bordering it, um, such as Egypt, uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, uh, etc. And uh, Israel didn't exist at the time because Israel came into being in 1948, uh, but at the time it was the the British Mandatory Palestine. Um, so the Italians actually they started in July, uh, the bombing of Palestine and the bombing of Tel Aviv. Uh, actually, there were only a few of those because uh, uh, the civilian targets were not uh, the ones kind of most targeted by the Italians. Um, but it was mostly uh, Haifa which was targeted, um, which was an important harbor and also um, oil refinery. So the, the oil that was coming from the Middle East was being uh, processed in the refinery in Haifa and put into tankers and, uh, and shipped um, to the UK, but also to, um, to elsewhere. And uh, this oil was something that, of course, the British uh, badly needed during the World War II because all the kind of uh, war machinery from the tanks to the airplanes and everything else. 
and not only as fuel, but also all these other kind of side products that were made as lubricants and, and everything else that is made from oil. Um, so the fact that Italians actually bombed uh, the refinery in Haifa uh, temporarily paralyzed the, the British um, in, the, in the beginning of the World War II. So, um, um, so it made me think that actually maybe what we see on the, on the frescoes is on one side kind of, uh, which are again made in the same year, we don't know about the exact months when the frescoes were made, but we could also look at them on one hand as the bombing of Tel Aviv, and on the other side, all these kind of clouds that are coming out and the storms kind of uh, being maybe airplanes bombing something on the ground. Maybe what we see here could be actually bombing of, uh, of Haifa. And this is the moment when it is speculative because the history is true and the frescoes are true. There is no way to prove actually that this is the true except of hijacking a format of a tourist brochure that gives you a feeling that this is the truth. Um, and I would like to show you like a uh, few videos because I also kind of became fascinated how if you do research like this, which I normally don't do kind of such historical research because I mostly work with contemporary art, um, but actually how much material you can find on YouTube and uh, how you can also see this, also both parts, you can also see the videos made by propaganda, by the Italian propaganda and you can kind of also find the videos made by the, the British uh, counter propaganda. So they're quite short, I would like to um, play both if you have time. And this one is the Italian one made about bombing of Haifa. And of course I love the music. It's like, yeah. Actually, I'll only share one because I think uh, uh, I want to uh, put time into other things. But that, what I wanted to show by this video is also that actually the, the year when the frescoes were painted is also the, you know, the bomb, for the bombing of Haifa, there was this kind of like visual imagery that was actually produced by the state. And um, um, so it was, not, uh, it was not something that the Italians would be kind of like hiding these operations. You know, these operations had really been celebrated and it would not be surprising if they also wanted to celebrate them in the, in the frescoes. So the, uh, the British video, which I will skip for now, but maybe we can look at it later, uh, it kind of shows this other perspective as uh, 
Italians, these barbers who have also bombed a mosque, a very old mosque, and kind of like they're trying to show a little, also a little bit of the destruction of the heritage. And um, again, I mean, kind of trying to think how to uh, connect this talk to uh, Romania. I wanted to show these pictures of uh, bombing of, uh, of Ploiești, uh, which was the, the oil refinery north of uh, Bucharest, um, which was bombed towards the end of the World War II in 1943. Um, by the Allies, and uh, and these two events, I mean, or this event is again kind of connected to the uh, to Italian history uh, because the the bombers that bombed Ploiești, they actually they departed from Libya, which has been until 1943 um, still Italian colony. So at the end of the West Desert campaign, when the Italians were defeated in in North Africa and the Allies uh, kind of took over. So the, uh, the British and the Americans, they could use it as a, as a starting point. And, uh, and you can see they flew from, uh, from Libya, like uh, in Albania, uh, to, uh, to bombing of Ploiești. So this imagery is again like very similar to this burning of, um, of the refinery. And again, if you're interested, there's this uh, short video. So one kind of like one strand of this research is apparently, I mean, or obviously looking into uh, into the resources, this oil kind of that have been uh, crucial for conquest of different territories and for bombing and destruction. And uh, the other thing that really interested me was uh, kind of um, ideology, but uh, particularly the Catholic Church and the role of the Catholic Church uh, during fascism. And uh, so that kind of brings me to the second temporality that I mentioned in relation to the frescoes, uh, which is the time of the Crusades. And this is again a romanticist painting uh, that is, in this, in this case, it's a French one, uh, also from mid 19th century, that is depicting the, um, the conquering of Jerusalem in year 1099. So the Crusades start 1095, and in 99, Jerusalem is conquered. And um, um, you can also see this kind of like more uh, medieval imagery and again the, uh, the Dome of the Rock, uh, which is mistakenly by the Crusaders uh, been understood as the, as the Solomon Temple, but it's actually the same site, but it is, uh, the Solomon Temple didn't look like this, um, but the, the Crusaders thought so. And um, so if the Crusaders, I mean, of course they had like different um, 
uh, economic and ideological kind of uh, reasons for um, uh, for them to take place. But the kind of main official uh, reason has been that the Christians should take over the, the holy sites and to protect the pilgrims that have been uh, on their pilgrimage from Europe to, to the Holy Land. So the two holy sites uh, in Jerusalem are the, uh, the rock uh, Golgotha, where Christ was uh, crucified, the site of the crucifixion, and the tomb of Christ, uh, where Jesus were, was buried and after three days from where he, uh, he was resurrected. So right now we're looking into the, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and uh, so this kind of structure inside that's where the Holy Grave is actually located. And this is the Crusader Church with this um, kind of quite iconic um, dome above it. And also this dome has been something that I have been thinking about um, in relation to Casa del Mutilato because you could maybe, man uh, you could maybe notice that it had this circular opening in the middle. Uh, which is kind of like this geometry is uh, ingrained like in the fascist architecture through the architecture of the 18th century of Nicolas Ledoux and so on. Um, but it is also something that goes to antiquity and to the Pantheon, but actually also to, uh, to this church. And uh, while Pantheon kind of stands for the, for the Roman Empire um, as one of the legitimization for, um, for the Italian conquest in the Middle East, um, the other kind of um, circle structure would be this church, uh, which is like the, the holiest site of Christianity. And uh, so looking back at the frescoes, if, uh, if saying that the, what we see there, the three crosses is the rock of Golgotha, so then my question was, what would be the, uh, what would be the hills on the other side covered in this like mystical bell jar or something that we don't know what it is? Um, so my suggestion, again, like very speculative, was that maybe we can look at this, and, and I also have to say I'm not a believer, so it has nothing to do with that. Um, my suggestion was that this could be the side where Jesus was buried. And again, kind of like looking at these like three temporalities um, and getting ourselves into the, into the mindset of the Roman soldiers, we can kind of see not the church, but we can see the actual holy sites before the architecture was built, like above them. And uh, I'll also explain later and that I also think that the, the, the cupola that we see shows not only the holiness of the site, but also the cupola of the church that is there today, but also the church that was supposed to replace the, the current church. So if you look at these two holy sites, so uh, today they are uh, one next to each other. So this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that I showed you. Uh, that was the cave where Jesus was buried, and that was later removed, and uh, the new tomb was built there. And this is the, the apex of the rug of Golgotha, um, and above it is the, the chapel of Golgotha. And today they are joined under, uh, under one church. So it's also kind of a little bit like, you know, dividing this into the two frescoes, the two holy sites, but they are actually uh, next to each other. And um, this research brought me to uh, looking into um, this Italian architect, uh, Antonio Barluzzi, who is also nicknamed the architect of the Holy Land. So um, the, the Catholic Church has been quite active in, um, in Palestine, um, also in the early 20th century. And some Italians moved there and they worked for the church. And Antonio Barluzzi built a number of uh, prominent churches in Palestine. And um, in the year 1940, he was invited by Archbishop Gustavo Testa to, um, to kind of design a new uh, ideal model of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the church that I have just uh, shown you. Um, and in January 1940, another Italian architect came uh, from Italy, from Venice, um, Luigi Marangoni, and they together were, um, they asked for the permission from the British authorities to take like detailed measurements of the church, uh, because uh, as I explained, uh, Palestine was the British mandate at the time, so we needed permission from the authorities. And uh, they uh, created this kind of ideal scholarly model, apparently. So there's this drawing and then there's also this model um, which is their new design of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So basically what Archbishop Testa asked them to do was to completely dismantle the existing Crusader Church and to build this new basilica 
uh, in its place. Um, which was also in 1940, which is the same year as the frescoes happened and as the bombing of um, Haifa and Tel Aviv happened. And of course you can see this uh, cupola in there, which is built above the, uh, the Holy Grave, which is kind of, I would say, the, this kind of mystical bell jar that we might see in the, in the frescoes. And uh, um, for this church to actually be built, um, so you see on the, the first image is the is the map of the old town of Jerusalem at that time. So the little square uh, there shows the church as it is, as it has been and as it is still today. And the picture in the middle shows the size of the new church that they were thinking of, which would erase basically a whole neighborhood of the old J Jerusalem in order for this to happen. And um, the property that would have to be expropriated in order for this like enormous expansion of the church uh, was Muslim property, uh, which the British uh, kind of protected because the British have this kind of um, um, respect for, for private property of, of any kind. Um, so actually, in order for this church to be built, uh, the Italians would really have to conquer, kind of reconquer Jerusalem in this Roman and Crusader uh, kind of manner. Um, and in order for this church to be actually uh, possibly to be built, so in case this church would be actually built, it would not be only a monument to the Christianity in the Middle East, but it would also become a monument to the, uh, to the victory of fascism uh, in the Middle East. And I wanted to like, uh, uh, read like two uh, short quotes just from this. So um, also around this period, um, the, uh, the Bishop of Terracina, which is one of the cities in Italy, so, for, for example, he expressed uh, in one of his preachings to his flock that only when the flag of fascist and Catholic Italy is unfurled over Christ's sepulchre will the Holy Land receive the veneration it deserves. So this was also kind of like rhetoric that some members of the church in Italy were, were using that only if the fascist flag will fly over the, the tomb of Christ that is the moment when the Holy Land will uh, finally be venerated. And it's also important to say that the, um, a few days, I think like nine or ten days after Italy declared the um, uh, war on the UK and France, which were basically the two countries that controlled the Middle East since the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so there was a petition of uh, two Italian archbishops and 47 bishops who petitioned Mussolini uh, to take the Holy Sepulchre uh, out of the hands of Britain and to entrust it into the Italian royal house of Savoy. So uh, it's also important to say that the Italian kings, they had this traditional title of the kings of Jerusalem. And since the 20s, since the fascists um, uh, took power in Italy, they also worked on, on this alliance between, uh, between the Italian royal house and the holy sites. Um, and of course, like kind of like thinking about this monumental church in, uh, in Jerusalem again, kind of like trying to think like what's going on in Romania. I, um, I was looking into this project of this uh, another kind of uh, bombastic church of the um, Roman people's salvation uh, uh, cathedral, and um, which is actually almost nearing its completion. Uh, which, in a way or another, even though it's an Orthodox church, in my in my kind of uh, thinking, I thought that this is actually the church that was supposed to be built in Jerusalem by the fascists, but never got built. But actually, instead, is being built by. Um, uh, by other conservative so uh, forces in, uh, in the middle of Bucharest. And uh, in this relation, I also wanted to include this uh, work from 2004 um, by Vlad Nanke called uh, Proposal, which is kind of funny for, uh, for me because um, when we thought about the Casa del Mutilato and we thought about it also about maybe the building being mutilated in itself, um, uh, we thought that actually what is missing is the cupola, that there is only the circular opening, but the cupola has been kind of amputated from the building. And, uh, and in this case, this is another kind of uh, Casa del Mutilato to which the artist has kind of like redrawn the cupolas that kind of belong there and kind of suggest the transformation of this kind of uh, useless monumental building instead of building another useless kind of monumental building. Um, and in this connection, I mean, I just wanted to say that it's, I don't think this is something that is happening only in Eastern Europe, this kind of like a, 
new historicism. So this is another building that is nearing its completion, uh, which is the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, um, which is the partly accurate reconstruction of the Berlin Stadtschloss that was destroyed at the end of the World War II, uh, where um, uh, ethnographic collections, uh, but also other cultural institutions will move in. Uh, in this is the museum Insel in the city center of Berlin. And I also wanted to kind of show this other, that there has been research on, uh, by others on the relations between, between the fascism and, uh, and the Catholic Church. And maybe even though it, uh, it is not possible to say that the Catholic Church as such uh, collaborated with, uh, with fascists, and there were a lot of uh, high profile or high-ranked high personalities within the Catholic Church that has been uh, throughout the 30s, but also uh, during the World War II, uh, under the closed look of the British Secret Service um, and intelligence. And uh, there's people who are described in those files, as, but also by their contemporaries, um, as having fascist sympathies. So the, uh, the person that we can see here is the Cardinal Nicola Canali. And uh, why I actually chose this, um, personality is because in the uh, year 1940 um, he also became the, um, the head of... Uh, so during the Crusades there were several of these uh, orders that were, that were established, this kind of Christian military, military, military orders. And the most famous one is of course the, the Knights Templar that were actually dissolved on um, uh, in uh, 1307, which is actually the beginning of um, the Friday the 13th, which is actually also today, but it was actually 13th of October. Uh, so that's actually the beginning of the story of the, of the bad luck uh, on this day. Um, but actually there were other, um, there were other uh, military orders that actually uh, have not been dissolved or that have been dissolved but have been re-established. And one of these orders has been the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, which kind of came into being in order to protect the Holy Sepulchre and the pilgrims that were, uh, uh, that were going to Jerusalem to this Holy Sepulchre. And um, in, the, in the 20s and 30s, the head of this order, or the administrator, was the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem. But in 1940, uh, Cardinal Canali, who was this kind of pro-fascist guy, who had also a very good career after the World War II, um, so he became the head of this, uh, of this order. And um, this order is actually quite massive until today. As you can see, there's a picture from 2013. Um, I don't know how many members there is, but it's, a, it's an organization that is um, uh, worldwide in the, in the, let's say, Christian world, uh, which comprises mostly Europe and uh, the Americas. And, um, and this is the last thing, the last bit of my presentation that I, that I want to like, talk about a little bit about this, uh, this order, which is again kind of connected to the Crusades, but has also this uh, fascist period. This is just the structure of the order. So the Pope is at the, on top at the moment, it's this Cardinal who is the Grand Master, and then you have the Latin Patriarch who is uh, also in charge. Um, and um, so I should say that actually, um, Mm. As early on as 1927, uh, one of the fascist party officials contacted this order, which the full name of it is the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre. And uh, so he wrote this fascist uh, party official to the order, observing, uh, quote, how greatly his eminence Mussolini has at heart the prestige of Catholicism and Italy in Palestine and how it, it is always the wish of the Duce to acquire greater influence through our joint institutions, meaning the state and the church, which have such historical and political influence. So two years later in 1929, actually Mussolini became a knight of, the, of this order of uh, first rank, um, by which he kind of became the protector of the order, but also of this uh, Church of Resurrection, which is another name for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And what became interesting for me is that, the, because we have been working uh, uh, in Palermo, is that the, this order also started growing in the 30s in Sicily. And uh, while in um, 1932 there were just like really few members, like in 1937 this order got uh, 
in their hands uh, one of the oldest churches in Palermo, which is San Cataldo, uh, which is uh, one of the churches of the so-called Arab Norman heritage, which is from the same time as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So these two events of kind of the crusades in the Holy Land and the reconquering of Sicily from the Arabs, they happened at the same time. And in 1937, all of a sudden, seemingly out of blue, this order gets, um, gets this church in the city center of, um, of Palermo. And uh, of course, it's not like... Um, actually, I contacted the, mem the leadership of this order to kind of look as into, uh, if we could look into their archives and if maybe we could see if maybe the architect of the building was a, was a member or not, because we know he built uh, churches later on, a lot of the, or the church that he built in Palermo had uh, also the circular shape but uh, they just said that they didn't have any archives and uh, they didn't or at least they said they didn't have a, a list of the members um but um but the links between this order uh, back in the 30s and fascism is kind of obvious uh, through this link through mussolini but also uh, through other links and this was also the way how to bring this to contemporaneity because this order is something that actually still exists today and it's basically a club of um, quite rich people who are invited to join this, um, this club. Um, and they donate, uh, um, I would say, I guess, large sums of money that, um, that are meant to enable the Catholic Church, uh, its continuous presence in the Middle East. Um, and I wanted to uh, show you this video at the end um, which is a promotional video of this order and in which you can again see this kind of very uh, crusader um, uh, aesthetics and you can kind of think back to the frescoes of thing, seeing if, if actually what we see in the frescoes is the size of the, of the crucifixion and of the, and of the holy tomb. Um. The equestrian order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem is nearly a thousand years old, started by our founder, Gottfried Bojan, at the time of the First Crusade. And our mission remains unchanged over 900 years, which is the defense of the Holy Land, the Holy Places, and Christians in the Holy Land. It's no longer that we uh, strap on swords and ride horses to go forward to defend the rights of the Church. But instead, we pledge our monetary support to pay for the upkeeping of the holy places in the Holy Land, and also to provide educational benefits to all people, regardless of whether they be Christian or not. Some Catholics pray, some Catholics evangelize, some Catholics give to the poor and support of the church. Uh, but we, as Knights, are called to do all three. That Mass and the Holy Sepulchre support the Latin Patriarch in his um, endeavor to keep the Christians in the Holy Land. We support schools, um, housing, education, and the Holy Family uh, Hospital. With the politics of the region, it's getting more and more difficult for the Christian community to remain there because people are leaving. And so we need to be able to make sure as an order that we do everything we can to continue a Christian presence. Much of the secular world doesn't realize the stabilizing influence that the Christians have in the Holy Land, despite representing only 2% of the population. Their presence essentially ensures that the Jewish community and the Muslim community don't have it out one another. The only way for peace to have a chance in the Holy Land is for the church to remain there, to do what she does best. If the Christian presence in the Holy Land were to disappear, holy places would become nothing more than museums. We would not be able to worship in the places where salvation history took place. What does that say about us? If we can't support the Catholic Church in the Holy Land to the extent that the Christians feel comfortable in remaining there. If we're no longer able to have those freedoms in our own cradle, it would certainly put the jeopardy of our faith throughout the world. In these days when faith is waning, People no longer have hope, though it, it is only a city and, and brick and, and mortar. It is something that we can look to that substantiates our faith and keeps us uh, looking for the Mother Church.
so just to like uh, just to round up I mean uh, of course this is like almost uh, one hour lecture but I mean what uh, what kind of my idea also has been with this research was really to kind of like try to condensate it and to really like make this tourist brochure which kind of like uh, reorients the way how you look at the frescoes and kind of you look at something that you think that looks kind of familiar it's just like soldiers in this kind of very generic war-torn um, landscape but actually by making something like as simple as uh, as this brochure uh, like uh, potentially you can like reorient and contextualize this uh, um, this frescoes to the public and you can kind of make them understand like how um, how this building, but also just a part of this building as its frescoes, how this can tell you a larger story of the uh, of the relations between uh, between fascist Italy, the colonial ambition of fascist Italy, uh, particularly in the, in the Holy Land and the so-called Holy Land um, and the, and the Middle East, and how it can also show you this kind of propaganda of this uh, kind of continuation of this uh, three temporalities. As if the as if the Romans and the Italians they have always been there, kind of legitimizing their claims to this uh, uh, to these territories. So um, so I kind of like still believe. I mean, we we left some of the brochures there, and I kind of still believe that some uh, local people will pick it up and uh, and they will kind of start thinking differently about uh, this fascist heritage that is there and that is everywhere around us. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, questions. Yeah. I'm aware that it's uh, that it's very dense because it goes like from uh, from the year uh, thirty to uh, um, to year nineteen. Um, I don't know forty three or something like that. So it's like. Um, almost like uh, um, 2,000 years of, uh, of history. But uh, if you're not too exhausted, then I'll be happy for uh, questions or comments. Also, maybe in relation to the uh, Romanian situation if someone wants to comment on that maybe I don't know. if not it's also fine and we can also have an informal discussion afterwards Yeah, I can go to it. Um, I mean, the idea was that the, uh, it was more connected to the building of this of this church, which I really find fascinating. And uh, on one hand, like uh, there's so many strange things going on, but you still can't believe that in 2018 someone is be building like this neo Byzantine um, church. And uh, of course, even though as, I, as long as I understood, um, the church is being built like from uh, private donations. So it's not necessarily public funding that is being uh, poured into this building. Um, but then kind of, uh, for me, the link was uh, between this project of this uh, two architects in Italy kind of like planning this uh, megalomaniac church and, uh, and this church is being built in uh, um, in Bucharest, and then the link with the with the people's palace has been the, the I think one of the things was um, uh, of course this was not built uh, during the fascist period. I mean this was built uh, after the World War Two, um, but I think the one of the kind of constitutive elements of fascist architecture is not not only the form, um, but it's also the kind of very dubious function that you build like a very imposing structure that, that very rarely actually serves a society. It only serves kind of, you know, it's, it's a kind of this facade that, that is trying to impress you. 
Uh, in some cases, of course, it is uh, a train station or a post office or something that the population kind of like benefits from uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure and their daily errands. But quite often it's this like um, uh, administrative building or like in case of Casa del Mutilato, is this building like uh, for the soldiers uh, who, um, who have been um, have been serving their nation. And then the other link is that, um, as I said, we, um, we looked at the, um, or actually Fernanda, who is with me on the stage, Fernanda Ruiz, um, who is an architect from Chile. She was thinking a lot about, uh, about this building actually as being mutilated itself. And um, thinking about the, the body of the soldier as mutilated, but maybe also the history as being mutilated. And if there was anything mutilated from this building, then you would think it's been the cupola because there is this circle opening. So one of the interventions, for example, that she proposed was to have this uh, mutilated cupola kind of have it downstairs in shape of a kind of bowl, which could be a kind of um, amphitheater or something. It could be a place for meeting where the different people of communities could come and, uh, and meet in this kind of like shape where you could also have, of course, benches and this mutilated cupola that actually has never been, of course, planned for this building. Um, um, but that kind of through this, um, what we already have in our hands, because we think of the Pantheon and we think of, of the churches and so on. So we kind of feel that there is something maybe missing. So to reinsert this missing part in the same way how uh, through these brochures we try to reinsert like this missing part of the history that fascism tried to erase. So in one of her drawings, which I don't have here, she also like kind of drew this, this cupola. And then I really like the Vlad's uh, proposal here where he also just uh, did something very simple, which is to draw the, the cupolas of the, um, on the palace of, uh, the, of the people, on the building of the palace of the people, uh, saying that uh, maybe there's no need for building this uh, new Orthodox cathedral. Maybe we already have, the, or not me, we, but you have already this, um, this monumental building and maybe it can just be transformed into, uh, into this cathedral. So, um, so that was the link. Yeah, I don't know if I made it more, more clear. But of course I also wanted to, um, um, even though this is not the, um, this is not a talk about contemporary art. I also wanted to in include I mean, a work of uh, contemporary artists from Romania as a kind of commentary on the, in relation to, uh, to architecture and in relation to the uses of architecture. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, the, uh, the conference that was organized and also the kind of the will more coming uh, from the professor of the course has also been about the reuse of the fascist architecture. So, if, I mean, this is also kind of um, um, proposing a reuse for, um, I mean, of course, it's a, it's a joke, I mean, but uh, it is proposing a reuse of this uh, communist building for the uh, for church. So, like, kind of from one uh, ideology to, uh, uh, to another. While, of course, the, the thing that, for example, uh, our professor is more interested in is to reuse the, the fascist architecture by the migrant by the migrant communities or other kind of marginalized communities who maybe have lack of spaces in the city um, for their activities. But then you don't find it problematic to uh, mix two kinds of architecture in the same. I mean, I find it a bit. Shocking to, to see this in this context. But if you take this because it feels very much like uh, it enforces a very strong narrative, uh, which is uh, uh, like it's given to us in all forms, like in all. Uh, you mean that like the communism was fascism? Like no, no, but I mean, of course, I mean this. This is to, I'm totally not trying to reinforce this. I mean uh, um, that. Uh, I mean, that I have to apologize, this is the impression that you got, but I mean, uh, um, I think that the, but I think we can agree that there's nothing left wing about this building. That I think we can agree on, I mean. That there's nothing left wing about, the, and there's nothing socialist about this building, I mean.
why I don't think that this. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think first of all because it kind of uh, reproduces like very imperialist aesthetics. I think that's uh, that's number one. Uh, that is very similar to uh, um, the aesthetics of both fascism, but also of kind of like a, I don't know, like Waldorf Astoria or some kind of like really fancy hotel. And then uh, the second, I think, is that the, to build this kind of building in a country where uh, like a large amount of people live in kind of underdevelopment, so to speak. I don't think that this is a very social gesture to build a, something like this for the use of the few and for the rest to be like watching this from the outside. So um, I think for that reason. But, so you think that uh, during the period when this building was constructed, that Romania was underdeveloped? No, I mean, I think that there were people who have not been uh, doing so well that they would not have missed the resources in their lives that they would have decided to invest no, into this. No, but you mean the ma vast majority of people? Well, I think that now... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but now you're pushing me into a very precarious position because, I mean, this I'm not from Romania and... This is uh, what you're arguing. No, it's I'm... Not, I mean, you said that this building is built in a kind of uh, aesthetic that is in high contrast with the precariousness of the people who have to watch this. This is what your argument, huh? But I must also agree with I think it's... But I want... Uh, I, I mean, I, <laughs> so if this is the argument, then I would like to... I mean, the argument is coming obviously from this church, as I already explained to you, which is built next to this building. And then I think it's really interesting to juxtapose it in relation to what I told you, the reuse um, of saying this. But I mean, if you're trying to say that the, this building is emanating some kind of uh, socialist values, then I really don't understand how. Well, it's emanating the power of the socialist, Romanian socialist state before 89. Not for me, but I think it's... Uh, it's also fine to disagree, but uh, I think it would be very sad if this was the values it's of uh, socialism. It's one building of a very large complex of buildings, but in the same period there were built a lot of other buildings, so this is not the only building that it was built, so uh, it's, it's uh, bigger than any other building that were built in that period, but I don't see why this building is not part of the same I mean, it should be understood in, the, in its context and not in the context of fascist architecture. I mean, this is outrageous, what you propose. I mean, what I propose is to like look at the church that is built next to it. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, I mean... From the beginning, all of this research is more like an artistic approach or narration, more to, like stretching history, stretching narration, stretching back. But to say... From yeah. the beginning, it's a metaphor. It's not just I mean, what we spoke about together before was also the, um, also with, the, with you guys, was that the, um, I think that, the, and we are slipping into it again, that actually it's impossible to like uh, discuss what was before the socialist history, because like we're discussing only the socialist history. But I mean, for me, like, uh, it's not about the, I mean, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this train station uh, that was built uh, for the members of the Royal Court uh, in 1935, in this kind of very, um, like, straight classicism uh, of, um, um, that is not so far from, uh, from the architecture in, uh, of Italy, I mean, then, uh, it's also about the use. I mean, then you can say, okay, now today people can use this uh, building as a train station. So it's like, uh, all of a sudden it is a public building, but, um, uh, but I don't see actually how, um, but I mean, again, I mean, I'm not from here and uh, I didn't come here to claim, definitely not that, uh, um, that everything from the last uh, 60 years of the history of architecture should be put into one basket. But uh, for me, definitely this building does not... Uh, I'm not relating this to fascist architecture, 
Uh, but at the same time, I also don't see how, um, how this building uh, should be seen as a positive example of socialist architecture either. So I think that's not something that we're going to agree on, but I don't agree into what you're pushing like me into saying that this is fascist architecture. That's not what I'm saying. So um, I think that's it. Any other questions? Mm, I mean, that's, um, that's again something that I'm not so interested in. I mean, I'm, I mean with this, uh, I think, picture that I have uh, selected, like this picture, it's not about him as a personality, it's more kind of like revealing in this infrastructure that is kind of invisible to say that there is this order and this is the infrastructure of the order that the... Uh, um, and then again, this, this picture is more like to show like the, the, this order of the Holy Sepulchre that I'm talking about is not like some kind of obscure thing from the Middle Ages or today. It's not like that it has like uh, 10 members that live in, uh, in Vatican or something. It's more to show like the, the scale of uh, uh, at which we are talking about. But honestly, I'm not, you know, I'm not so... Um, if I have not been dealing with this particular research, I don't think that I would start digging into um, uh, into church, and it's also something that kind of uh, doesn't interest me really. Like whether whether this pope is slightly better than the, than the previous one, I don't think that it really like uh, mm, I don't think that it fixes my my trouble with church as an institution in general. So. Um, it's, it would be like a very kind of monarchist model of saying like, oh, at this moment, this probe is not as bad as the previous one, but it doesn't really fix things on the structural scale. So, um, but again, I mean, I'm not, you know, it's, it's again something that I'm, I feel quite detached from because I'm not, uh, I'm not a member of any church and I'm not a, uh, I'm not a believer either. But it's something that I really find fascinating how uh, um, how the beliefs can be hijacked like for different uh, ideologies and um, and how also in Italy the uh, the Pope that was uh, in place during the World War Two how he's also seen as this kind of uh, good figure who kind of like uh, protected some of the Jewish population from the deportations etc etc. But again, it's kind of centered on the on the Pope, but all these other people who were members of the church and the higher ranks, such as cardinals and archbishops, etc., uh, who had like uh, clear fascist sympathies, they're all suddenly kind of like erased from the story because the church has actually been the good guys like during the uh, during the fascist uh, period. Um,